Welcome, everybody. Ambassador, thank you. We're, thank you. Uh, we're delighted, honored that you're here and to lead this conversation. Uh, just, uh, I think we, before we begin, you know, I, I must say I've, I've been going to Korea for, I suppose, 30 years. You know, many people in the room, some of them are old like me, like Skip over there. He's been there a long time. And I can remember, uh, you know, going down, walking along the Han River before it got pretty, you know. I mean, we've been doing a lot to improve the Han River. but. And it always used to be uh, a great gathering place on weekends, you know, for Korean families. And what always impressed me um, was how, how deeply Koreans love their children. I mean, it's just something magic, <laughs> this very, very deep emotional uh, tie inside families, and especially with children. And it, uh, it tells me why this was such an enormous tragedy with the ferry. I mean, we've all been, our hearts have been aching mm -hmm. for everybody in Korea. It's um, just like, it, just, it, the world feels out of joint. Mm -hmm. So I think we should all just, in our own private ways, we all have our ways we do this in our personal lives, our spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. uh, remember Korea and remember the families mm -hmm. of Korea. These, there are families right now that are mourning a, a loss that's deeper than anybody can explain. Mm -hmm. And it's our role now. There's not much we can do you know, individually so far away mm -hmm. other than to hold them mm -hmm. in our memories and to tell them that they're not alone to get through this mm -hmm. tragedy. And it's a terrible tragedy. And it's a, it's a, it's Korea's a strong people. I know this from my own personal experience, really strong people. Korea will come through this, but it hurts. It hurts deeply. Mm -hmm. And we hurt and feel that pain with you, Ambassador. Mm -hmm. Please, you. on behalf of everybody here, mm -hmm. please convey Thank our you. deepest sympathies and very best wishes you know, to the government and to the families, especially mm -hmm. for this. Um, I was very pleased that President Obama went out of his way to go to Korea mm -hmm. on his trip to Asia. Mm -hmm. Uh, it it wouldn't have been right not to go to Korea. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at the challenges and the tensions, the strains geopolitically that have been playing out over the last year, uh, it's become clear to me that this relationship with this crucial partner country is more critical by the by the week. And I'm very glad that the president did visit. There are so many major issues in front of us together. Mm -hmm. It's not Korea's burden to carry. It's ours to jointly mm -hmm. carry. And what I'm hoping that we can do today is learn from you about those conversations, mm -hmm. Ambassador, and kind of share in this dialogue with each other. That we can learn more now. It's the follow-through. It isn't just that one visit. Those visits, you know, in some sense, they're a bit artificial because everything's worked out in advance. <laughs> but it's carrying it forward. <laughs> and I think I hope that you would approach this session with all of these colleagues in that spirit. Help us figure out how to help you, Thank you. to help our government carry it forward. Victor, let me turn it to you to get this started for real. I just want to say thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, thank you. Ambassador on for your working with us so strongly through the years and we look forward very much to hearing you today. Thank you. Victor, why don't you take it over? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So are we supposed to go up? Uh, yes, up there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which side should I be? This side or this? Uh, this I is believe for you're on that side. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, John, for that uh, very kind and um, thoughtful introduction uh, for today's event. Uh, I think we all share the same um, uh, feelings that John does here at CSIS. Um, before we begin, uh, let me uh, uh, introduce our guest, um, uh, Ambassador An Ho Young, who is, as you all know, Ambassador of the Republic of Korea to the United States. 
He joined the foreign ministry in 1978 and has held a number of postings throughout his career, most recently as first vice minister of foreign affairs and trade at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, prior to this, Ambassador Ron served as Korea's ambassador to Belgium and as head of the Korean mission to the EU. He was appointed Deputy Minister for Trade at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade from 2008 to 2011, during which time he also was the President Sherpa for the G20 and the G8 outreach meetings. Uh, he has also served as Director General of the Multilateral Trade Bureau and as Director of the International Trade Law Division in the Office of the Minister of Trade. And so he has a very distinguished career. There's much more on his CV that I could take you through, but we only have a limited amount of time but most importantly, most importantly, he's a graduate of the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. <laughs> so um, uh, Ambassador An was kind enough to come by this afternoon to uh, uh, talk about, assess uh, the visit of President Obama to Seoul last week, uh, as well as um, have a discussion with all of you here about the way forward in the relationship. So um, perhaps Ambassador Ron, I will allow you to, if you could, sort of give us your initial mm -hmm. uh, Im impressions and right. perspectives, and then right. we can have a discussion. Right. So thank you very much again for joining us today. Thank you so much. Victor, does my mic microphone work? Yes. Okay, working. thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. I just look around the room, and I said to myself, well, uh, how could I say, best and brightest <laughs> of uh, Washington, D.C. And then uh, for me, usual suspects, I go around the town when, where, where there are gatherings to discuss about Korean issues, where there are gather, gatherings to discuss, uh, discuss about East Asian issues, then I meet with you all the time. And then I should be thanking you, uh, Dr. Henry, for getting uh, together this, uh, this uh, where, where? admirable group of people all together at the same time. And then thank you so much for your kind words uh, with respect to this very accident. And you are right in the sense that uh, it is not just the accident. It is just such a large number of young people who were lost. And then it is for that reason that there is this deep, unfathomable, unfathomable, it's difficult to pronounce, a sense of grief back in Korea. And then in fact, I was uh, just concerned how it will impact upon uh, President Obama's trip to Korea this time. But uh, maybe you already uh, saw it uh, yourselves. He handled the situation very, very well. He was so sincere, and he was so thoughtful in expressing his uh, feelings, his condolences to the Korean citizens. So it was received very, very well. And then maybe uh, many of you would, uh, would have heard about it, which is that there is a story about Jackson Manolia. It was President Jackson, so when he came to the White House, uh, it was soon after the loss of his wife. So what he did was that he brought a plant of manolia, manolia from his garden, and then he had planted it in the garden of the White House. And what President Obama did this time was, he brought a small part of that manolia, and then he gave it as a kind of his tribute, his tribute to the high school uh, where the large number of victims came from. So his uh, thoughtful words, as well as this, this kind of very thoughtful gesture, they were received very, very well. So thank you so much for your kind words, and then thank you so much you, the government, and then the people of the United States of America have been doing uh, well as uh, we in Korea suffer from this very tragic accident uh, for, for the past several weeks. With respect to what I'm going to do this afternoon, then uh, I'm going to discuss with you what, how we have prepared for this President Obama's trip to Korea. I mean, what were the objectives we tried to achieve through this visit, and how, in my, in my view, those objectives uh, were met through the visit as well as, and then Dr. Henry, you're absolutely right when you say that where presidential visit, things in fact are very closely co orchestrated and then things have, have been worked out before the president arrives there. But at the same time, I think it's a, it's, it's a kind of important milestone. Each time it happens, it is an important milestone. And then before the visit takes place, then much work is done. And after the visit takes place, then again, follow up. As a matter of follow up, then much work is usually done. So you are right. 
is a part of the process. But anyhow, we very much appreciate this visit. So my presentation basically would be in two, two parts. First of all, the objectives we try to pursue through this visit. And then after that, how in my view those objectives were, meet, were met. So the first part, which is objectives. In my mind, there were about four objectives that we try to achieve through this visit. And the first of them would be to review and renew the 60-year uh, alliance between Korea and then the United States. And then in respect, I have to say, 2013, last year, was a very important milestone in the uh, bilateral relationship between Korea and then the United States. Why? Because last year, we commemorated the 60th anniversary of alliance between Korea and then the United States. So quite naturally, when President Park was coming to visit Washington DC in May last year, then there was an observation both in Washington as well as in Korea that we must take advantage, uh, advantage of this opportunity to review the 60-year uh, alliance between Korea and then the United States and think about how we could be renewing in the coming 60 years. So that's how it was felt in Washington as well as in Seoul. And then last year when President Park came, then we uh, in fact uh, concluded uh, the President Park's visit through something called joint declaration. And joint declaration was a document in order to do it. That is to say, review and renew the 60 year relationship between Korea and then the United States. This time, President Obama came to visit Korea after one year. And then, of course, we wanted to see what has been done over the past one year in order to further develop the relationship between Korea and then the United States. And then I have to tell you, this, I think, would be a very good time to be doing it. That is to say, to lay the ground for another 60 years of relationship between Korea and then the United States. Why? Because last year, it was the first year of uh, President Park's five-year presidency. Last year, it was also the first year of the second term of uh, President Obama, which means we have four or five years down the road through which the two presidents can do that together. That is to say, lay a groundwork for renewing the relationship between Korea and then the United States for coming 60 years. So that was the first objective we wanted to achieve. Second objective, that was to deter the North Korean provocations and to encourage North Korea to come forward for a more constructive relationship with South Korea, with the United States, and other countries of the international community. So that objective would be straightforward, so I'm not going to elaborate it. And then there was a third objective, and then the third objective was to build an architecture for peace and cooperation in Northeast Asia. And what do I mean by that? If you observe international relations in Northeast Asia these days, then uh, there would be a couple of very cons cons conspicuous observations you would make, which is for the past 60 years, every and each country in Northeast Asia, they developed the economy in a very impressive manner. At the same time, the relations between and among those countries got deeper and wider. But somehow, that deepening economic relationship, somehow that did not spill over to other aspects of relationship among countries in Northeast Asia. Well, in fact, it was just the other way around. That is to say, while on the one hand, economic relations were ge uh, getting deeper and wider, on the other hand, relationship in, in other fields, somehow they were getting, uh, well, more negative. So that's a phenomenon which was called by my president as Asia Paradox. So it's a paradox in the sense that on the one hand, economic relations are getting tight all the time, but on the other hand, political and then, and then other relationship, it is getting, getting more tense. So that's what my president ha has been calling as Asia Paradox. And what, do we have, what can we do in order to improve the situation? And that's the reason why my president came out with a proposal of dialogue for peace and cooperation in Northeast Asia. And we thought President Obama's trip, in fact, it can have very positive impact in order to advance this idea of building architecture to strengthen peace and cooperation in Northeast Asia. 
So that, that was the third objective. What was the fourth objective? The fourth objective was in order to reaffirm our commitment to what I would call rule-based global order. And then, of course, this fourth objective, again, is rather straightforward, so I wouldn't elaborate it. So these were the four objectives that we tried to pursue through President Obama's trip to Korea this time. So that is the, put, the first part of my introductory remarks. Let me move on to my second part, which is how, in my view, those four different objectives were met. With respect to the first, ob uh, first objective, that is to say, review and renew the 60-year relationship between Korea and then the United States, the 60-year alliance relationship. I think I can refer you to a document which you can find on the website of the White House. And that document is called as Joint Fact Sheet, 60-year alliance between Korea and then the United States, a global partnership. That is the name of the document, Joint Fact Sheet. And then it's a six-page document. So maybe uh, not, not all of you would find time to go through them. So let me try to highlight some of them, some of uh, the, the, the points we find in the joint fact sheet. So I will try to do it in three different areas. The first area would be political military issues between Korea and then the United States. And then for that, of course, the most important issue would be how to further strengthen combined military capabilities between Korea and then the United States. And then for that, since uh, President Park's trip to Washington in, uh, in May last year, then many important uh, progress has been made. For example, in order to deal with the threats arising from weapons of mass destruction coming from, the, uh, coming from North Korea, then of course there was uh, something called tailored deterrence strategy. It was adopted in the past one year. And then in order to uh, better deal with uh, conventional threat arising from, no uh, from North Korea, we came up with uh, counter-contingency plan between Korea and then the United States. And on top of all of them, what we did this time was we uh, agreed, upon, uh, agreed in order to reconsider the transfer of OPCON, that is to say wartime operational control from uh, United States to Korea. So the conditions and the timing of OPCON transfer is to be reconsidered. So that, I think, is an important progress which has been made for the past one year as well as through, through President Obama's trip to Korea this time. Another important progress which I can bring to your attention would be uh, there was an uh, address which uh, President Park made when she was coming to visit Dresden, Germany. And there she came up with her vision of uh, unified Korea. And this time, when President Obama came to visit Korea, he, uh, in fact, uh, well, provided very warm support, firm support for this uh, vision, President Park's vision for unif unification of Korea expressed through Dresden's speech. So these, in my view, are important points or highlights of uh, progress which has been made in political military area. So moving on to the second area, which is economic area, then of course the presidents discussed about how Korea-US FTA has been implemented for the past one year, for the past two years, and then both of them uh, expressed satisfaction about how well uh, the agreement is working for the benefit of both of our economies after two years. And at the same time, President Obama, he in fact, was very well briefed about how this chorus FT is working. So he said, well, there are a couple of uh, issues uh, we, came to, we came across in the implementation of FTA. And then they are uh, rules of origin, or uh, market access in automotive sector, transfer of financial data, and uh, export of uh, organic products. He, in fact, did not uh, look at the notes. He just spoke out from his understanding of those issues. And then he said, well, it was reported to me that we are making a good progress in, in uh, resolving those issues. And then I'm very encouraged about it. But at the same time, we will have to continue to work hard in order to see to it that there would be a even fuller implementation of Korea-US FTA. 
And then the two presidents also exchanged views and then welcomed Korea's intention to participate in TPP. And at the same time, in the same area, that is to say, same area of uh, economic cooperation, then the two presidents uh, uh, exchanged a lot of uh, ideas about how we could further strengthen our cooperation uh, for, in order to find uh, new sources for growth for our respective economies. And then for that, of course, there would be many things we could be doing together in terms of joint research, in terms of developing uh, new, new models of business, in, uh, in, in, in encouraging, uh, say, uh, business startups in each of our economies. And then they uh, expressed those views or had uh, consultations in various different way areas like uh, uh, well, renewable energy or ICT or biotechnology. So, so we came to find that both of them were, were extremely interested in the idea of further promoting cooperation in order to provide new sources for growth for bo both economies in Korea as well as in the United States. So that's the second, second area where the p two presidents had close consultation. And third area is the area I would call common efforts to address uh, global problems around the world, global issues around the world. And then with respect to that, then, uh, well, I guess there were two different sets of issues the, pre the two presidents uh, addressed. One was issues uh, we face in various different uh, areas of the world, like in Iran, or in Syria, or in Afghanistan. So all in all, uh, the two presidents uh, appreciated the joint efforts we are making in order to improve situation in those uh, countries around the world. But at the same time, there were a large number of issues, which I would call uh, thematic issues, which uh, the two president, uh, thematic issues in the area of uh, global cooperation, which the two presidents addressed together. And then that, I guess, I uh, better leave until I come up uh, to this fourth objective I, I told you about, that is to say, our joint efforts in order to address global issues. So they, they are the kind of uh, three different sets of issues the two presidents addressed, uh, and then what you find in joint, joint fact sheet in order to address the first objective I told you about, which is to re review and renew the 60-year uh, partnership or alliance between Korea and then the United States. The second objective I told you, about, told you about, it was about uh, to deter the provocation coming from North Korea and then to encourage North Korea to come forward for more constructive engagement with South Korea. And then for that purpose, then as you can uh, guess, then of course many of the things I told you about, many of the things which we find in the joint fact sheet, then of course they in fact would go in the direction of doing that, that is to say, deter North Korea as well as encourage North Korea to come forward for more constructive engagement. But at the same time, on top of that, we thought the President Obama's trip to Korea this time, it was a very uh, good timing. Why? Because in the recent past, and in, as many of you ha would have observed, the kind of uh, verbal threats, verbal provocation coming from North Korea was particularly noisy. So for that reason, I thought it was a very well-timed visit. And maybe uh, we could, uh, and then there was something, something, we, something pr uh, the, the presidents of both of our countries did, which, have, they, they, which have, they have not done before, which is they came to visit Combined Forces Command Headquarters at the same time. This is something they have never done since Combined Forces Command was, was established back in 1978. So again, that in fact was, was a very timely uh, gesture uh, in my mind as we have to deal with this uh, particularly ferocious uh, well, verbal provocations coming from North Korea this time. So that was how, in my mind, the, the second objective was met. With respect to the third objective, that is to say, to build architecture to strengthen peace and cooperation in Northeast Asia. Well, I guess there are several problems which must be addressed in order to do it. 
And then the problems to be addressed would include denuclearization of North Korea is one. And second, uh, fair and honest recognition of history as we understand it. That will be another big challenge that must be addressed if we could go and build architecture to strengthen peace and cooperation in Northeast Asia. And I think it was done this time. And then many of you would have heard what uh, President Obama said in the joint press conference. And then I'm quoting him word by word. He said, well, uh, between Korea and Japan, the future is, is important. But at the same time, in order to do it, there must be honest and fair recognition of the past. I'm quoting him most, word by word. Honest and fair recognition of the past. It's something that must be done so that Korea and Japan, and at the same time, uh, United States, could m move forward into the future. So I was, of course, at the press conference, and then, I, and then I was very, very encouraged to hear President Obama say that. That, in fact, is something we must see in our part of the world. And then that is the reason why I was uh, very positively encouraged to hear President Obama. So that's with respect to the third objective. And then let me come, come finally to the fourth objective, that is to say uh, the global partnership between Korea and then the United States, and then what was the discussion the two presidents made this time. Well, uh, there are so many things they discussed with respect to how we could be further stre strengthened partnership between Korea and the United States in order to address many of the challenges we face in the international community. And then one of them would be new forms of threat, security threat, whether you call it uh, nuclear security, or, or whether you call it cyber security, or whether you call it uh, global health security. They are the new forms of threat to uh, peace and security around the world. And then somehow Korea has been cooperating very, very closely with the United States in meeting those new uh, threats to security. For example, when it comes to nu nuclear security, then the first summit meeting for nuclear security, it was convened by President Obama in 2010. Second meeting was held in Korea in 2012. So that's a good example. And when it comes to cyber security, then the first meeting was held in London in 2011. Second meeting was held in Hungary, Budapest, in 2012. And third meeting was held in Seoul in 2013. So it is another very good example of very close cooperation between Korea and the United States. When it comes to global health security, it was launched sometime uh, in January this year. And then it was, one, it was one morning when federal government was closed because of snow. And then I was invited to that ceremony to launch Global Health Security Initiative at the uh, Department of HHS, Health and Se Human Security Services. That morning, it was very bad. The snow in my, in my garden, it was, I think, well more than <laughs> one feet. I couldn't eat, have my o own gate open. <laughs> so I called my assistant and I said, well, this, I, I'm sure, is a very important meeting, but, but I don't think I can make it. Why? <laughs> because I couldn't even have my own gate open. <laughs> so my uh, assistant gave a call to the Department of Defense because it, it was uh, jointly organized between HHS and the DOD, and then uh, said, sorry, my ambassador cannot make it. Do you know what happened? DOD, they sent me four by four <laughs> <laughs> so, so that they would fetch me from my, from my residence to the, to the Department of Homeland Security. And I came there and I met with uh, one, uh, one, of, one of the organizers and I asked him, did you really have to do it? You could have done it without me. And then what was the response? Well, we couldn't do without you. <laughs> Why? Because of the very, very close uh, well, cooperation we are having in addressing the, the new uh, threats to, uh, to health, global health security around the world. So I'm learning about all of them in the sense that uh, where it was at that meeting that I came to find that when you say a uh, new threat to he uh, health around the world, they were talking about, uh, well, not only the threat to, threat to health around the world arising from natural causes, 
bottles com coming from accidents, but at the same time, acts of terrorism in, the, in, in that uh, health, uh, health sector. So that's another good example. And then all of these made important uh, subjects for discussion between President Park and then President Oma Obama as they discussed uh, how we could continue to strengthen our cooperation in order to address challenges in the global community. And then uh, new, new sources of uh, security threat, of course, was not the only subject they discussed. They discussed about climate change. They discussed about, they, they discussed about development assistance. And then, uh, well, uh, I could uh, go on to talk with you about all those uh, detailed discussions the two presidents had with, uh, uh, on the occasion of President Obama's trip to Korea this time. But let me stop here. And then let me just stop by uh, telling you sharing with you the last sentence which has been uh, said by President Obama as we wrapped up uh, the discussion between my president and President Obama. He said, well, let, let's just think about all those issues we have discussed today. I wonder if there will be too many countries between the United States and then other countries where we could be dis uh, having discussion, detailed discussion on such wide ranging issues. So that's how President Obama wrapped up his discussion. And I think uh, I said myself, maybe I could be sharing this last sentence by President Obama, because I think it wraps, wraps up very well where we stand between Korea and then the United States after 60 years, and then as we begin new 60 years of relationship in the days to come. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think picking up, Mr. Ambassador, on your last point, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I remember when uh, we used to prepare briefing papers for the summits with Korea. Um, you know, you'd get about at most half a page per issue. Mm -hmm. But I remember the briefing papers got longer and longer because there were more and more issues, not mm -hmm. just North Korea and trade, for example, but regional and global issues. Um, that really sort of exemplify how much the scope of the alliance really has expanded mm -hmm. over the last 60 years. It's mm -hmm. quite, it's quite um, unique, I think, mm -hmm. in, in the history of alliances and certainly in the history of post-Cold War mm -hmm. uh, alliances to see this sort of mm -hmm. broadening scope of the U.S.-Korea mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what so, Victor, the half page, it was during the time you used to work at NSC. NSC. Yeah, yeah. Is it? Yeah, well, there was always a half. There was always a page for North Korea. Right? They got a whole page, but then usually at most half a page for each issue. But you know, as the summits moved on after eight years, mm -hmm. the, the the papers got longer and longer just because there were so many more issues. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you were talking about climate change mm -hmm. or nuclear security or mm -hmm. nuclear energy or especially development assistance mm -hmm. and now global health. Right. Now, I think one of the reasons why they sent the four by four is because mm -hmm. they see Korea as a very important partner mm -hmm. in the future in terms of global uh, health security. Right. Uh, given all that Korea has done on the development assistance side mm -hmm. as a member of the DAC and, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, and I think there's an understanding that Korea you know, once they put their mind to a particular issue, then they move very quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and this is when I think there's a lot of convergence between the United mm -hmm. States and Korea. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, if I could, I, there are a couple of questions I wanted to ask you right, before you. we right. open it up mm -hmm. to this mm -hmm. very um, mm -hmm. knowledgeable audience here. Mm -hmm. um, the first, you'll have to indulge me for a second, but mm -hmm. the first is a very simple question, but it's one I think that a lot mm -hmm. of people would like to ask, mm -hmm. um, and that is, um, so what's the personal rapport between <laughs> these two leaders? Right. Uh, you know, what's the chemistry like? There's, right. It's probably the most underestimated factor mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in foreign policy is mm -hmm. the personal friendship and relationship right, right. between the two leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, one gets a sense from uh, the television audience that they, they seem to get along quite well, but mm -hmm. your, your own view on what the personal relationship is like mm -hmm. between these mm -hmm. two leaders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I totally agree with Victor when, when he says that uh, this personal relationship between leaders, that, that in fact is a very important factor in managing uh, any relationship. And uh, when I presented my credentials to President Obama last year in uh, July, and one of the things I told President Obama at the time was this, which is that there is a picture, some of you do remember, there was a, in May last year, President Park came to visit Washington DC, and then they met in, in the uh, Oval Office, 
And then there was a picture between, taken between two of them. And then if you go into the over office, then there is a fire, fireplace. And then uh, there was a picture of uh, President Park and then President Obama sitting in the chairs, looking at each other, looking very intently at each other. And then in that particular picture, then it is my president making a point. And then President Obama looking very intensely upon my, 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 my uh, president with the, well, the expression on his face, which is thoughtful, smiling, understanding, and all attention, with undivided attention to what my president is uh, speaking, to her, uh, speaking to him. And I like that picture very much personally. So I came in to meet with uh, President Obama, and I said, well, President Obama, one thing I should be tell you is, you are very popular in my country, but there was this picture which, which was carried in almost all Korean newspapers, and then because of it, your popularity went up by several more notches. That's what I president, uh, told President Obama. And in May last year, I was not in town. So I could, wa I could watch it only on, on the picture. But this time, I could watch them at very close range. And I, and I can tell you, Victor, in the sense that that, in fact, is a very true re reflection of very good, very warm rapport they're having between the two. Mm -hmm. And then that's what I feel. But at the same time, next morning, that was in the morning of the 26th, I uh, met with uh, Evan Medeiros, as well as Daniel Russell. And then they confirmed that's exactly, that was their observation as well. The, the meeting went very, very well. And then maybe because of many things, because of good rapport. And I think one of the reasons why they're having such good rapport is the approach they have to issues. They, in fact, uh, are very committed to what they are doing. And they, in fact, read all the brief. And they, in fact, uh, well, well uh, in a sense, uh, put their ideas in order bef they, before they speak. And then I think they are, they are the kind, kind of qualities they share as a leader. And then that may be one of the reasons why they uh, find it uh, well, enjoyable to be talking to each other. Mm -hmm. That's it. it was, um, as you said, it, it was a, it was a extremely difficult time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for the Korean people and the mm -hmm. country when President Obama, I mean, I was actually there that same week. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the country was, the whole nation was, mm -hmm. Uh, obsessed and depressed by what had happened with the ferry. So it was mm -hmm. a very challenging environment, to say the least, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to, for the president to come into. Um, were there um, elements, uh, did they moderate the whole trip in any way in order mm -hmm. to allow for, mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I, the words he said were fantastic, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. but were there other elements of the trip, of the visit that were moderated in, in, mm -hmm. in respect of what happened with the ferry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are right. Uh, of course, when there is a presidential visit, and then of course there are, there are several advanced teams which come and visit uh, the country to be visited by the President of the United States of America. And there were several advanced teams which came to visit Korea this time. And I went through the programs being prepared by uh, the advanced teams. And I said to myself, well, maybe this is a very good program, but at the same time, we must think about uh, well, the general emotion gripping the Korean society. So maybe we should have this general emotion, this deep sense of grief, be uh, properly reflected upon the program. So without going into the details, I can tell you the, the program has been, uh, well, thought again and again, mm -hmm. so that it will go well with uh, the, this deep sense of grief mm -hmm. being, being felt uh, mm -hmm. in the Korean society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought the words he gave at the beginning mm -hmm. uh, that was televised around the world were very, right, were very right, good. Right, um, right. If, I, if I could move to a, a couple of the issues, um, um, I don't recall it being in the joint fact sheet, but one of the issues, of course, between the two countries is the 1-2-3 agreement. Mm -hmm. um, was there any progress made on this issue, or did mm -hmm. the leaders discuss it at all? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the two leaders discussed, of course, it's a very important issue. And then, and then uh, Victor, if you read it very closely, then, uh, then there, is, there is a section dealing oh, with there is? Uh, yeah, okay. uh, there is a section dealing with the uh, one to three agreement. And then what it says is that uh, the two presidents expressed views on the one to three agreement. And then uh, they uh, focused upon three important elements to be addressed through this agree uh, agreement, which is uh, uh, treatment of uh, spent fuels, and then sustainable supply of uh, nuclear, f nuclear fuels. Mm -hmm. 
and then uh, maintaining or promoting the competitiveness of uh, Korean nuclear industry. So they are the three uh, elements to be addressed through this uh, this agreement, mm -hmm. so through this amended agreement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to ask you about was the, um, about a week, uh, and this is on the uh, the economic side. About a week before uh, the president's trip to Asia, the Treasury Department uh, released a report. Um, and um, there was a lot of discussion in that report about uh, currency issues in Korea. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I thought, you know, pretty strong language, actually, by the Treasury Department on currency issues. Um, it, was there any discussion of this, or, or what's your view on this, or is there a way forward? Well, there was a discussion on that, but at the same time, I think uh, there are a couple of things we should be looking at. One of them is uh, the capital market in Korea. I mean, it is one of the most open capital market we have in Korea. And then we, when you have such an open market, open capital market, you wonder what you could be doing in order to do something artificial, in order to adjust the exchange rate. So that's, uh, that's something we should be thinking about. And at the same time, the record. And then the record is the Korean currency won has been appreciating, appreciating significantly uh, last year as well as this year. So it is appreciating significantly. So, well, uh, when it comes to concern expre expre expressed by Department of Treasury, then of course maybe they have a good reason to, to, to say that. But uh, there are a couple of things, as I already told you, that must be looked at. Mm -hmm. This, I think, is different from a large number of uh, other emerging economies where they have very closed uh, capital market and then where, in fact, their currencies are uh, depreciating, mm -hmm. continue to depreciate. But it is just other way around when it comes to Korean won. Mm -hmm. It's a very open capital market, and at the same time, uh, as I've already told you, it has been uh, appreciating significantly mm -hmm. last year as well as this year. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last question I wanted to ask you was um, going back again to the two leaders. So um, they have a continuing dialogue, uh, and I'm sure if North Korea acts up, they will have many more phone calls. So uh, as we look forward, when are the next sets of opportunities for them to meet? I guess um, UNGA in New York might be one, but mm. what, so what is, in your mind, if, what, how would you like to see your leaders continue their conversation both on the phone and in person in the coming months or even the next year? Mm -hmm. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, if we could, then of course we wish to make uh, meaningful progress with respect to North Korean nuclear issue as well as missile issue. At, at the earliest possible time. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, we have 20 years of record behind us. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that is not a record, but also a lesson for us. So that, I think, is something which, it, which is, lies as a basis of our approach to North Korea. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you are right in the sense that when the two, uh, two presidents miss, then UNG will be one opportunity. And in November, there will be other opportunities as well. Uh, during which they could be uh, well having a meeting if necessary. But even before that, I very much hope that we'll be able to make the progress. And then when we make the progress, and then this is something two presidents in fact discussed between the two, which is that well, we will be very firm in our response to any signs of uh, any measures of provocation com coming from North Korea. And then we'll be, be, be very firm in uh, conducting our, say, uh, uh, consultation with North Korea when it comes to nuclear issues. But at the same time, when North Korea is ready to come forward and then engage in more constructive uh, exchanges with us, then of course we will be ready to, to welcome them. Mm -hmm. So we hope uh, we'll be able to see uh, those positive moves uh, in, the, in the days to come. Mm -hmm. I, I think I saw somewhere, maybe it was in the joint fact sheet or someplace else, was that President Obama's trip to Korea made this the country he has visited the most of the Northeast Asian countries during his time in office? I think is that, is that, is I, that the case? Yeah, I think that sure is. Uh, I just checked the record, and President Obama came to visit Mexico five times. And then uh, Mexico, I guess, is the only, only country he visited five times. And then Korea, he visited four times. And then maybe only very very limited number of uh, countries which uh, President Obama visited four times. So it's fair to say that Korea is his favorite Asian country. <laughs> no doubt about that. No <laughs> doubt about that. Right. Okay. 
Um, um, so again, we'd like to open it up to the audience. Uh, again, we want this to be a conversation. The other thing I'm told that is we are also live tweeting this event. So uh, the online Twitter audience may ask us questions too at CSIS Korea Chair. Um, and the full recording will be available online later today. So with that, um, please, if you have a question, just raise your hand. We have microphones. Please introduce yourself uh, and ask your question. Uh, Larry. I'm uh, Larry Nix from CSIS. Mr. Ambassador, when you discussed uh, trying to build an architecture for peace and stability in Northeast Asia, yes. you mentioned as major problems the North Korean nuclear issue and the history issue. And those clearly are major problems. But it seems to me, in terms of this objective, there's another major issue now, and that is the issue of these maritime disputes that really have come to plague the region between Japan and China, South Korea and Japan, and even now potentially between China and South Korea. Was there any discussion between President Park and President Obama of the maritime issues during the summit? And is there any consideration being given to opening up a sustained dialogue between our two governments in terms of trying to build some sort of regional or international architecture that could lead to a settlement of these disputes? Well, with respect to some of the issues which uh, Mr. Nix has just mentioned, uh, well, I think one issue uh, which was uh, discussed was on, uh, say, maritime issues in Southeast Asia. And then, of course, we have been supportive of uh, the idea of uh, COC, uh, Code of Conduct in uh, Southeast Asia. And then, uh, of course, uh, freedom of navigation is a very important issue for Korea as well, in the sense that Korea is a major trading country. And then, uh, as a major, major trading country, freedom of navigation, we, we value, very highly value the freedom of navigation. And then when it comes to settling those issues on, on, on the basis of rule and on the basis of international law, then we are fully supportive of that idea. And then that, I think, is the reason why uh, when there was this issue of ADIS, extension of ADIS by uh, China in December last year, then we thought it's an issue upon which we must take a, a, a firm, a firm uh, position based upon international rules. So that's what we did. So these are the kind of examples. But what I think is important is, uh, well, uh, one way we could be dealing with those issues would be to firmly based upon rules, firmly based upon international law. And at the same time, as I already said, many of those issues are related with the issues of history. So they would have to be honest and fair recognition of history, as was suggested by President Obama. Uh, Scott Snyder. Hi, Scott Snyder, Council on Foreign Relations. Um, you mentioned uh, in your remarks that uh, President Obama gave a strong endorsement of the Dresden Declaration, but it also appears that the North Koreans are not so impressed. Uh, what do you think it is that the North Koreans are failing to understand uh, about uh, the Dresden Declaration? Uh, and you know what elicited such a strong rhetorical response uh, from North Korea to uh, the meeting between President Obama and President Park? Well, Mr. Schneider, uh, there were three elements in the Dresden speech. First element was, uh, well, humanitarian exchange between South and North Korea. So what has been suggested by President Park is, we are ready to further strengthen humanitarian exchanges between uh, two, two parts of Korea especially the health of uh, women and then health of uh, children, as well as uh, humanitarian exchanges in the form of uh, unification uh, between divided families. So that is the first element. Second element is, well, of course, one issue in which North Korea is uh, highly interested in, that is the economic development. 
and then we suggested where we would be uh, willing to cooperate with North Korea in building infrastructure for the economic development. Uh, so there is the second element. Then the third element is integration. Now the country was divided after World War II, and then that, uh, the longer it takes time, then of course there will be higher uh, degree of, uh, well, in a, in a sense, uh, alienation in the two, two societies. So President Park, the third element President Park emphasized was the importance of making further efforts to further integrate the two societies. So all in all, think about them. I mean, humanitarian exchanges, building infrastructure, and then uh, promoting integration between the two societies. I think, uh, well, it will be very difficult to object to any of, the, any of the three. So with respect to how North Korea is responding to it, we are very discouraged about the response. But at the same time, as I, uh, as I already said several times, we are ready when North Korea is willing to come forward and engage with us in a constructive manner, then we'll be ready to, to do that. But at the same time, uh, for the time being, maybe uh, it is not. I mean, North Korea is not. So we are, we are still waiting for that to happen. Thank you. Next question. Yes. Uh, 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 Duyan. Thank you, Ambassador Duyan Kim, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Thank you so much for your remarks. Uh, it's a bit of an easy question, but maybe not so as well. Simple question, but maybe not so, depending how you want to look at it. Uh, the alliance, no matter how strong the relationship is, it's, it's normal and expected to also encounter some uh, tough patches and low points, just as well as high points. And we are really at a high uh, right now, and some of the tough issues that were um, inherited or passed on from the previous Lee Obama administration, um, it seems that the Park Obama uh, Alliance is tackling those issues um, very constructively and in a positive manner, even though they are tough issues. Uh, but there still remains, in particular, among a few, um, the one, two, three is still um, a challenge that I personally and professionally see as an issue that could come up um, where the allies might have to uh, have some frank discussions and perhaps um, struggle with just a little bit just to get to a win-win situation. Uh, and so against that backdrop, I'm curious what you see as potential challenges and issues um, and, and leftover homework, so to speak, uh, where, where you might see some more frank discussions, but of course we're all in it to have um, good results, but some, some challenges that you might see going forward. Thank you. Well, well, as a matter of fact, uh, you are uh, you are right in the sense that how close you may be, then of course there cannot but be certain issues of differences of views. So you you're absolutely right about that. But at the same time, I think when you face those challenges, I think it will uh, be very important you do it in such a manner that uh, you in fact wouldn't forget the common objective you have between between the two countries so that uh, in addressing those uh, challenges, you in fact do not in fact do something which would be undermining this fundamental uh, important relationship be between Korea and the United States. So that's number one. I mean, you do it, but at the same time, you do it without undermining uh, this uh, important relationship. Second, second uh, uh, point I would, uh, I would share with you would be this, which is that as somebody who spent more than 35 years in the Korean government service, I'm not uh, very comfortable with the idea of uh, sharing with you what the challenges are. <laughs> 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 my, my instinct would be to walk out those challenges before I, before I share it with you. <laughs> so, so well, well, I think uh, it is not because I'm, I'm opaque, but because of my training for, for over 35 years. But if you raise specific questions which you perceive as a challenge, then I'll be very glad to ad address and then discuss them with you. So uh, before Admiral, we have a question on Twitter, which is, um, do you think North Korea is going to do a fourth nuclear test? <laughs> Why? And what are you going to do if they do a fourth nuclear test? 
Well, with respect to if it is ready to do it, uh, then uh, we have been saying uh, for quite some time now that there are indications that maybe they have done with all the physical preparations, physical preparations to be doing another nuclear testing. But at the same time, uh, with respect to when it is going to do it, then of course we, we should be raising that question with North Korean leaders. So that, that is there. And then with respect to why, why North Korea is doing it, that in fact puzzles me in the sense that, uh, well, uh, North Korea says all the time that in fact there are two parallel objectives they are pursuing. Nuclear development, well, weapons of mass destruction programs, but at the same time economic development. And then we know for a fact that two of them, they undermine each other. And then, uh, well, uh, given the economic situation in North Korea, any fair-minded, any reasonably-minded leader would, in fact, try to do something in order to improve the level of uh, life in North Korea, but somehow it is not happening. So that's, that's where we are. With respect to what we are going to do in terms of uh, as a response, if there is forced uh, nuclear testing, then uh, not only Korea, but also the United States and other members of the six-party talks, as well as all members of the international community, they are extremely, extremely frustrated about what North Korea has been doing for the past 20 years. And then it is because of that that we have been taking many measures, multilaterally, bilaterally, and regionally, in order to uh, discourage North Korea to do it. And uh, most probably, if there is going to be the first uh, nuclear testing, then I think North Korea would, uh, would have to face all these, uh, well, measures of sanction being further strengthened bilaterally, regionally, as well as multilaterally. Mm. So for that reason, we very much hope, we urge North Korea not to do it. Mm -hmm. It does not serve the uh, interests of anybody, mm -hmm. including interests of North Korea. Mm -hmm. Thanks, okay. Um, Errol McDevitt, question. Uh, Michael McDevitt from uh, Center for Naval Analyses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your comments. I wonder if I could draw you out a little bit on the issue of uh, OPCON transfer. I think you said that uh, it was going to be the conditions for transfer are being reconsidered. Uh, does that mean that you're focusing on, or we are focusing on, a condition-based assessment? In other words, when certain conditions are met, then the transfer will take place? Or we're just thinking about setting a new date 2016 or 2017 or whatever. So is it condition-based or working toward another date specific? Well, Admiral McDavid, uh, as I said, that's what we find in the joint, st uh, joint fact sheet and then, and then what the joint fact sheet is time, timing, and then the co condition can be reconsidered. And then you are right in the sense that it will be uh, condition-based but with respect to another part of your question, if the, we, we are going to come up with a new timing, well, well, as a matter of fact, we are in the process of uh, working out the conditions as well as the timing. So I do not think uh, I'm ready to address that question. So l for the time being, let us just leave it, leave it uh, 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 where it is. That is to say, time, there was an agreement between two presidents. The timing and the conditions can be reconsidered. Uh, we had a number of questions. Yes, right here. Hello, uh, Alexander Sullivan from the Center for New American Security. Thank you once again, Mr. Investor. Um, in Kyoto News recently, there was some uh, discussion of Chinese contingency planning for a sort of North Korean contingency and, and what their role might be. Um, and at the same time, you know, uh, over the past year or two, we've seen I would argue a general warming of relations between China and, and uh, the Republic of Korea. Um, now, I'm not one um, to view you know everything in Asia through the lens of China, but I wonder if there was any discussion between President Obama and President Park about what uh, China's role is expected to be on the Korean Peninsula in, in the coming years. Well, a couple of uh, weeks, ago, a couple of uh, minutes ago, then we were talking about uh, all those sanctions that the international community is imposing in response to uh, WMD program in North Korea. And what what is the international community trying to achieve through those sanctions? It is to control the flow of technology, flow of capital, and the flow of materials flowing into into North Korea, and then bulk of them are coming into North Korea through China. 
So I think whether it is a sanction being done bilaterally or regionally or multilaterally, then I think very important to get the, the cooperation and support of China. That's obvious. So that, in fact, is uh, one of the, the very important discussions we're having between Korea and then the United States. But at the same time, very important discussion which, which is taking place between United States and China as well. So the way I look upon it is a kind of, there, well, if I look upon six-party talks, I always look upon it as a kind of concentric circle in the sense that at the very center of the concentric circle, then of course we have Korea, we have United States, but as we fan out in this uh, concentric circle, then we sh what we should try to do is that let them, I mean other participant, participants in the six-party talks, to get as close as possible to the center of the concentric circles so that uh, we could be uh, dealing with North Korea with uh, hopefully a unified voice. So in that process, of course, the position being taken by China would be extremely important. Do you, do you think, um, to what extent is Korea worried about the U.S. pivot? You know, there's a lot of talk. We just had a conference here last week about the transatlantic mm -hmm. um, pivot to Asia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, many in Europe are concerned the U.S. is pivoting to Asia. But I get, to s get the sense often in Asia they're worried that the U.S. isn't pivoting enough. What is Korea, is, is, you know, to what extent is Korea concerned about the pivot? Um, and then um, the extent to which the pivot is mutually consonant with South Korea's desire for a deeper strategic engagement with China? Well, pivot to Asia, when it was announced in uh, 2011, towards the end of 2011, I used to be ambassador to European Union, mm -hmm. so I was in, I was in Brussels. Mm -hmm. So at the time, I remember many European ambassadors coming to ask me what I thought about this pivot to Asia. And then what I answered them was, it, it used to be my standard answer to my European colleagues, which was, well, looking upon European relations with Asia and U.S. relations with, with Asia, there is so much going on between the uh, United States and East Asia that in fact, in my mind, they are not getting back. They have always been there. United States has always been there. And then it is my true assessment of uh, US presence in Northeast Asia, mm -hmm. as well as in broadly in Asia Pacific. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the record shows uh, the US presence, presence in East Asia, it has been a very stabilizing influence. And then it has been a very important element contributing to peace and security and prosperity in that, that part of the world. So we are encouraged about it. And then this trip President Obama has recently made to East Asia, I think in a sense it was reaffirmation of U.S. presence in Asia mm -hmm. as well as U.S. rebellions to Asia. Mm -hmm. So apart from, well, what the specific, specific measures are being taken in order to implement U.S. rebellions to Asia, then of course uh, we hope to see more of it uh, to be done. But uh, well, in general, we are, extrem we are ext extremely encouraged about this uh, a policy which is commonly understood as a rebellion station. Mm -hmm. And d but does that put any pressure on your China policy? Does that uh, interfere at all with your China policy, or do you see these as a non-zero sum, non-zero sum game? You 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 said it in the right manner in the sense that this that's not a zero sum game as we see it. Mm -hmm. Right. We are all in it together, yeah. and I think there is a common interest. When I say common interest peace, stability, cooperation, more prosperity, then I think everybody will benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Korea will benefit from it, United States, Japan, China. Mm -hmm. So I think it must be, it must be a positive sum game, and then we must uh, work among all the actors in our part of the world to make sure that it will turn out to be a positive sum game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so you had a question, yes, right here. Sang Jae Kim of CSIS Visiting Fellow. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, what is the common uh, evaluation of North Korea and Kim Jong Un regime during the summit of the two leaders? In addition, and during the first uh, term of Obama administration, is North Korea policy was that kind of uh, uh, you know strategic patience? And at this meeting, uh, did President Obama totally? Uh, endorse 
uh, President Park's vision of Dresden, you know, the declaration. And is there any indication of you know, the uh, US uh, policy change of North Korea? Well, I think we have, we, have, we have already discussed several times today why we have uh, that policy of the United States, and then why we have uh, our policy, South Korea's policy toward North Korea. So I think given uh, our experience for the past 20 years, especially what we went through when we had the Geneva Framework Agreement of 1994, and then when we had 2007, uh, February package of 2007, as well as uh, some something we went through in 2012, then uh, broadly speaking, there was, uh, there was a broad, a broad spread frustration with, re with respect to the record of implementation on the part of North Korea. And I think it, it provides a basis upon which we should be uh, developing our strategy toward North Korea. So well, that's something we learned over the past 20 years. And then, as I uh, already said several times, then I think uh, it should be a well, uh, well, two-track approach with respect to North Korea. On the one, one hand, when it comes to all different kinds of pro provocations, we will have to stand very, very firm in South Korea, as well as between South Korea and the United States. But we very much hope, and then we encourage North Korea to come forward to begin constructive relationship with us. So that, that was a broad confirmation or affirmation of this uh, approach to North Korea through uh, the recent visit of President Obama to Korea. Uh, Dan Bob. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I'm Dan Bob with Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Um, Japan is moving uh, toward reinterpretation of its constitution to allow collective self-defense of some sort. It may be rather constrained. This is something the U.S. has welcomed for some time, and uh, I'm wondering if you can tell me what your government's position is on this and how much it's influenced by, say, the comfort women issue. Thank you. Well, between Korea and, Korea and Japan, we share so many things. We share, say, common interests. We share common values. And then uh, we share strategic interests. And then uh, what I think about, say, uh, all these discussions taking place in Japan these days with respect to further strengthening Japanese, Japan's uh, uh, defense capabilities, what I think is this, which is counterfactual uh, situation. Count by counterfactual situation, what I mean is uh, we, in fact, I mean, uh, in our group, in fact, we have been discussing about all those historical issues lying between Korea and Japan. And then counterfactual situation I think about is, what if all these statements, what if all these actions, which in fact agitated public opinion back in Korea for the past one year, what if those actions, those statements had not been made for the past one year? It could have been different. But at the same time, I think uh, all these discussions, it must be done in reflection of this uh, historical baggage lying behind Korea and Japan. And that is the reason why these uh, statements, which had been made by some of the Japanese politicians before, right, as I repeat, the Murayama statement and Kono statement, they, those statements, as well as vision of some of Japanese leaders to, in fact, I'm, I'm quoting uh, President Obama's expression once again, honest and fair recognition of history in fact, those statements, uh, Murayama statement and Kono statement, they in fact were, were in fact, uh, well, very helpful efforts that was made by Japanese politicians and Japanese people in the broader sense in order to do it. That is to say, recognize history in honest and fair manner. And then somehow, that has been going backwards for the past one year. So that is the reason why we hope uh, this historical issue would uh, put on the right track and then move forward so that overall relations between uh, Korea and Japan could uh, move in the future directed uh, manner. And then that, uh, as I already told you, is the reason why I was, uh, I was very encouraged with this statement coming from President Obama with respect to the future between Korea and Japan being so important 
but at the same time, in order to do it, why it is important for Japan, Japan to come up with understandable, uh, well, a recognition of this past history. We have time for one more question. Yes. Hello, Frank Ahrens from BGR Group. Mr. Ambassador, nice to uh, have time with you today. My question is somewhat related to that. It has to do with the Dokdo in the East Sea of um, Korea. What efforts is, is the government here and the embassy, the mission here, doing to really win the argument uh, here in the United States that Dokdo belongs to Korea? Um, I know there was a textbook controversy recently in the Virginia legislature that touched on this matter. If you could talk about that a little bit, I'd be appreciative. Well, when it comes to Tokto, then, then of course, uh, I don't think any one of you have been to Tokto. <laughs> but there is an island called Ulungdo, which lies to the north of Tokto. And from Ulungdo, if you look south, on a fine day, you can, you can have the glimpse of Tokto. On a fine day, let me mind you, on a fine day, not on a, on a, on a, on a gloomy day. On a fine day, you can, you can have a physical view of, a clip, uh, of Tokto with their eye. You don't, need, you don't need a binocular. You can have a view of a Tokdo from, from Ulungdo. So that is the nearest island, habited island from Tokdo to the north of uh, Tokdo. Where is the nearest island from, uh, from Japan? That's island Oki. And then island Oki, the physical distance between island and Tok Oki, it is at the very least two times uh, well, longer than the distance be between Ulungdo and then Tokdo. That's why we say, geographically, that's the reality. Historically, for that reason, there are many historical records which, in fact, mention about this phenomenon. That is to say, if we go through the histori historical records, they say, well, from Ulungdo, on a fine day, there is an island you can see, right? W the reason why I emphasize on a fine day is because between Tokdo and then Ulungdo, there are other islands which can be seen. Can be seen even on an overcast day. But Tokdo is the only island you can see without binocular on a, on a, on a fine day. So there are, that's the reason why I say historically there is no question at all why it is curious. So it is, it is our position on Tokdo. Geographically, historically, as well as legally, it is, it is Korea's territory. And then if you come into the website of the uh, Korean Embassy, then of course you can read all of that. And then thank you so much for your question, because uh, this time I can tell you loud and clearly why Dr. is Korea's territory. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, I think I better stop there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Ambassador, I mean, the, the, the fact that the president has been to Korea almost as many times as he's been to Mexico shows, I think, that Korea is not considered a distant ally, but a very close and intimate neighbor. Right. of the United States. So I want to thank you very much for joining us today and giving right. us uh, your, your views on the summit and the relationship going forward. Thank you right. again. Right. Well, thank you, Victor. Victor, thank you so much for having this opportunity for me to address these uh, friends of Korea, very, very knowledgeable friends of Korea. Thank yes, you so very much. knowledgeable. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you again. Right. Thanks. Thank you.